just to say, as usual, hello everyone and thank you for coming to our uh, weekly CISIFPU seminar on gravity. Today we are very happy to have with us uh, Pedro Cunha from the University of Aveiro. Just to give you the usual CV summary about the speaker, uh, Pedro completed his PhD in the University of Lisbon in 2019 and later he moved to, to be a postdoc in the, in the Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics in Potsdam, in Germany. And now he's back in Aveiro, back in Portugal. Uh, he's a recognized expert on the physics of black holes, in particular of black hole shadows and the physics of the light brain. Uh, and today he will talk about the constraining ultralight scalar fields around the M87 black hole using the H AHT shadow. shadow sorry. Uh, so, as I said, we are very happy to have you with us here, Pedro, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Can you please confirm that you are uh, hearing me well and still seeing the, the, the screen? We are seeing the screen and we are hearing you very well. So, okay, great. So, I can begin now. So, so I, hi, everyone. So, uh, thank you for the kind introduction and also for the invitation to give a seminar at CISA. So, it is a pleasure for me to be here. So in this seminar, I will be discussing the recent image of the black hole by the Event Horizon Telescope uh, that was released in 2019 and also some related research. So I'm a postdoc uh, researcher at the University of Aveiro uh, working on black hole physics and also mainly on testing GR using black hole imaging. So our journey to the image of the black hole has actually started more than 100 years ago on May 29th, 1990. So there are two expeditions on that date, one to Sobral in Brazil and another to Pinsp Island. And in, on these expeditions, it was recorded the displacement of star images during a, sol a solar eclipse. And with this displacement, it was possible to measure experimentally how gravity bends light and make the first major experimental test of GR. So it is quite ironic, I would say, that almost 100 years later, almost exactly, that the first image ever of a black hole was revealed to, revealed to the world. And in a similar spirit to the Pinsp and Sobral measurements, this image also shows how light rays become highly curved to the, due to a strong gravitational field. So the, this famous image on the left is a snapshot of the very compact object M87 star that has a mass of about 6 billion solar masses and lies at almost 17 megaparsecs away from us. And with this mass scale, M87 star is a very strong candidate for a supermassive black hole. And in order to achieve the necessary angular resolution for this image, it was necessary to use an array of telescopes scattered across several continents, forming the Event Horizon Telescope, or EHT uh, for short. And by using very long baseline interferometry, the combined uh, array of, of telescopes formed an effective telescope with the size of our planet. And the key point is that the final image was consistent with the GR prediction for a curved cur black hole with an accretion disk flow. Um, so this is just a few comments about the, this object. So this supermassive black hole candidate M87 star, it lies on the faraway, faraway galaxy MS, MS, Messier uh, 87. The supermassive black hole is one of the largest that is known at the moment. And it is in fact so large that our entire solar system could fit inside it. And this uh, black hole candidate also emits a very powerful jet uh, at relativ relativistic speeds, stretching almost 5,000 light years. But to understand the image of M87 star in detail, first we have to understand what is the expectation for a black hole image. So we can take a very generic academic setup. We can take a spherical symmetric compact star of mass M and radius R that has some surface uh, texture. Texture. If we take the exterior of the star as vacuum, then the exterior uh, of the star is described by the Schwarzschild solution. And we can obtain the synthetic star image on the left via numerical ray tracing of light rays. When the radius is larger than 3M, the star image can be a good measure of the surface texture information. Even if the star, star, star surface is completely radiation absorbent and has no emission, like on the right image, 
the star outline still reveals its structure. However, we can notice that when the radius of the star is smaller than 3m, the star edge becomes circular and it no longer displays any surface texture. So in this case, the image of a star that is completely radiation absorbent becomes ind indistinguishable from a black hole. And so the dark image of the star would be the same as the shadow of the black hole. And the reason for this is fairly simple. It is because the edge is, not, is actually describing the, the image of the light ring orbit, which lies precisely at r equals 3m, and not actually the star surface. So to further understand the image of a black hole, you can imagine another academic setup where you are observing a black hole just in front of a background of starlight. So in this case, the light rays are attracted to the black hole's gravity and the observed image that you can see uh, on the left appears distorted due to gravitational lensing. And here is the same image of the lens star field where you can see better the details. Of course, you, you might remember that a black hole does not emit light classically, and so it, it, it image is literally the absence of light. And so it is quite appropriate for the name that this dark region in the image is called the shadow of the black hole. We can also notice that the black hole creates multiple image of the same star. For example, the star image A2 that you can see in the image is just a copy of the star image A that you can see here, A and A2. And actually, the entire sky appears copied and inverted within the Einstein ring, which is this dashed circle that appears on the left image. And the copied image is due to the strong bending of light by the black hole. This deflection increases even more as we approach the shadow edge. Light rays make more and more turns and give rise to more images, image copies uh, of the sky. And in fact, as we approach the shadow edge, light rays approach a limit bound orbit. This process can be understood by a scattering, lay, scattering light ray close to a black hole. The light ray can escape to infinity, it can fall into the black hole, or it can approach said bound state orbit. And in spherical symmetry, this bound orbit is the light ray, which is simply a planar photon orbit that encircles the black hole forever, although it is typically unstable. And due to spherical symmetry, these circular orbits form what is known as the photon sphere in spherical symmetry. So uh, if you take the scattering of light rays around the Schwarzschild black hole, the light rays need a certain impact parameter which is just large enough to escape the black hole. And so the shadow size will correspond to the bundle of light rays that barely fall into the black hole. And indeed, the Schwarzschild shadow radius is almost 2.6 times larger than, than that of the Schwarzschild radius. And due to spherical symmetry, the Schwarzschild shadow is simply a perfect circle. Focusing now on the Kerr shadow, so now detouring from, from Schwarzschild, each point of the Kershado edge is, is determined by a spherical photon orbit, just in contrast to a photon sphere. So in contrast to light rays, uh, light rings, I'm sorry, uh, the general family of these spherical null, null orbits is not planar. So each spherical orbit is uniquely identified by two impact parameters, which I'm denoting here as eta and q, which are related to constants of geodesic motion. For example, the pink point that you can see here on the shadow edge here on the left is determined by the black circular orbit in the right. If we start moving along the shadow edge, the pink points now determine, are, the, are now determined by these red non-planar orbits that you can see on the right with a larger radius. And also notice that this red orbit is open at the poles. And as we move, move along the shadow edge, there is another spherical orbit, now in blue, that at some point has zero angular momentum. And this one closes at the poles that you can see here. Moving in even further, there is another spherical orbit um, where the radius of the spherical photon orbits still continues to increase. 
but the amplitude of the orbit outside the equatorial plane now becomes smaller. And when we reach the last point of the shadow, uh, it is again determined by a circular photon orbit, although now with the opposite rotation uh, of the first one. So let me just emphasize that in contrast with the Schwarzschild case, the curved shadow is determined by a photon region instead of a single photon sphere. That is the key point here. In addition, uh, the curved shadow edge can be determined analytically. Let me uh, just sh show this, this clip. Um, so the curved shadow edge can be determined analytically due to the geodesic motion being completely geodesically in integrable. And as the spin increases, the shadow goes from a perfect circle for the Schwarzschild case to a shape which is similar to the letter D uh, for as we approach extremality for curve, as you can see in this clip. Um, so in the extremal curve limit, the shadow edge is represented actually by, by a very compact and nice analytical, analytical expression that you can see uh, over here uh, in units of the ADM total mass. Okay, so this was all very academic. In a more realistic scenario, the contrasting light that you need to see the shadow does not come from faraway stuff. So black holes can be typically expected to have an accretion disk of orbiting bright glowing matter. So what would be the black hole image with a geometrically thin accretion disk? So to represent this, on the left, you can see the more realistic black hole image, although it was made for uh, this famous Hollywood film Interstellar that was generated with a very simple disk. And although you have uh, this strong gravitational lensing by the black hole, uh, due to this strong gravitational lensing, lensing by the black hole, the disk appears both above and below the shadow edge in the image. But still, this is a thin disk and it's still a very simple uh, approximation. If you, uh, then you can ask the question, how, the, how would the black hole image look like in a more astrophysical setup? So, um, in a more astrophysical setup, the light comes from mainly from synchrotron radiation due to uh, the dynamical accretion flow around a black hole. And so you can generate synthetic images um, by simulating general relativistic magneto hydrodynamic accretion flows around a curved black hole. And although these synthetic images are trickier to interpret, the shadow edge is still a prominent feature, as you, as you can. Uh, compare these two images right here. This is for the more academic setup, and this is for the more realistic one. Still, however, you have to compare the simulated black hole image with the actual EHT observation. And then one faces the issue how to replicate the observation conditions. Uh, since the Event Horizon Telescope has limited resolution, a simple way to mimic the final image quality of the Event Horizon Telescope is to simply apply a Gaussian blurring filter. And as you can see here, after starting with the original synthetic image, after you apply the blurring filter, you obtain an image which is, which is actually fairly similar to the actual EHT data image that you can see on the, on the left. So the key point is that the observed image is so far consistent with the prediction of a curved shadow. The situation might change as the resolution of, um, of ongoing and future uh, observations by DHT uh, are improved. <clears throat> okay, so let me sh show you another clip. So if you want to see the connection between this final Event Horizon Telescope image and the image of the lens disk of the interstellar film, so I'm going to show you now a clip which is a courtesy of Double Negative, uh, which is the special effects company behind the Interstellar movie. And you can later check the, the video link uh, here, if you want, on YouTube. So let's see if you can watch it. So uh, as you start with an observer on the equatorial plane, uh, you see the, the disk, uh, which appears both above and below the, sh the, the shadow. 
But as you approach the, the axis of rotation of the black hole, the disk appears more circular due to axial symmetry. Uh, let me perhaps show, run the clip again. Yes. Uh, so you start close to the Kotora plane in this, in this, in, in this case. You, you see the, the part of the disk above and below as before, but now you move outside the equatorial plane and you approach the axis of rotation. And due to, due to axial symmetry, the configuration appears more and more circular and more and more symmetric. The reason why we, uh, the reason to do this is that we are actually observing M87 star close to its axis of rotation. Okay. And after we then apply a blurring filter to the image, we actually obtain something which is remarkably similar to the actual EHT observation. So again, this is a, a video that was um, made by double negative, courtesy of double negative. Okay. So as a follow-up question, the emission that we, see, that we see on the black hole image comes from exactly which region. So the source location of photons that make up the black hole image, you can see displayed as bright regions in these two plots, each for a different emission model. So on the left, we have a low magnetic flux model, or SANE, and on the right, we have the maximal magnetic flux model, or MAD, uh, and both of these are for a curved black hole with a spin of 94%. And although both emission models are quite different, both are actually consistent with the EHT observed image. And the photon region, which is now highlighted in white, is, if you recall, what determines the black hole shadow edge. However, you can see that there is still some emission uh, contributing to the final black hole image uh, that actually comes from outside the photon region. So the key point uh, is that the emission ring that you see here on the black hole image doesn't have to coincide exactly with the black hole shadow edge. So the data that you can see on the or original EHT paper is that the observed size of the emission ring uh, is about 42 micro arc seconds in the sky. And from a large library uh, of accretion flows uh, of the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration, one can estimate that the actual shadow size should be around 10% smaller than this value. So a conservative estimate for the shadow angular size of M87 star is then around 18.9 micro arc seconds, which is here denoted by the Greek letter theta. And this angle is then related, of course, to other quantities by this formula, uh, namely the that involves quantities like the observer distance L to the black hole, which is assumed to be large in this context, and also the black hole mass scale M. And this expression includes also, importantly, a model dependent dimensionless factor S, which is represented here by the letter S. And for a curve, this, this value is typically five. And, and so a deviation from the curve model should impact on the value for this uh, factor S. So currently there is a lack of tension between observations and the curve hypothesis, but Kerr is likely uh, a fair approximation within the current precision that we currently have rather than something fundamental. So this Kerr paradigm is, is motiva motivated by multiple uniqueness theorems so that essentially uh, state that equilibrium vacuum black holes in GR are described by the Kerr solution. So these uh, are uh, these due to a series of theorems, by, namely by Israel, Carton, and Robinson, famous theorems. So this has kind of motivated a, a paradigm that all black holes must be described by the Kerr metric which was, was nicely summarized in Miller's mantra that black holes have no hair. So they are not described by any, uh, any uh, parameters beyond the mass, the angular momentum, and the electric, electric charge uh, in some cases. So this poses the, 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 the important question if astrophysical black holes are really described by the Kerr metric. So what could be an alternative to the Kerr black holes? If you, you can consider black holes in GR, but with matter fields, so you go beyond vacuum, 
It's a way to circumvent the unique, uniqueness theorems I just mentioned. An example are black holes with synchronized scalar proca hair by uh, a lot of work by Carlos Herdeiro and Eugene Hadou. Um, another possibility are compact objects that have no horizon. An example are Gerva stars and Bose proca stars uh, that I'm going to mention in a bit. And also black holes of, in alternative gravity theories. Uh, and one of among many is, for example, Einstein, Einstein dilaton Gauss Bonnet. But I'm going to focus mainly on one of the simplest ways to circumvent these uniqueness theorems, which is just take GR with a matter field. And one of the simplest matter fields that you can take is an hypothetical scalar field, which has mass mu. I'm going to denote the mass uh, of these scalar fields with, uh, with mu, uh, which you can inter interpret as being part of the dark, dark matter content in the universe. So you can take the action uh, of the scalar field uh, simply as the Einstein-Klein-Gordon theory with a complex massive scalar field minimally coupled to gravity. And you can find full black hole solutions that are in equilibrium with this scalar field. And these solutions are known as black holes with synchronized scalar hair. So just a few comments about these solutions. The metric ansatz is fairly general. So you assume stationarity, axial symmetric and asymptotic flatness, also a Z2, ref Z2 reflection symmetry around the equatorial plane. And these solutions, uh, as it turns out, they are both regular on and outside the horizon, and they satisfy all energy conditions. And they naturally have uh, two killing vectors, uh, delta T and delta phi. Um, with all metric functions only depending on, on the coordinates r and theta. Although these, these uh, functions have to be determined numerically. And let me point out that although you have killing vectors, um, uh, these killing vectors are not symmetries of the full solution when you take into account the, the scalar field and where you take these harmonic ansatz for the scalar field. And these T phi dependence does not appear at all level of the geometry. So this T phi dependence that you have here in this harmonic type dependence does not appear at the level of geometry. But these, these, uh, these numbers, M and omega, they, they do appear. So the solution space of these black holes with synchronized scalar hair, uh, here represented with M equals to one, they interpolate in these plots of the total black hole mass in ADM versus the horizon angular velocity, W. These interpolate, uh, they exist in this uh, um, uh, pinkish uh, region here. They interpolate between the curved solution here in blue, the extremal hairy black hole solutions in green, and the rotating boson stars, which is the solitonic limit in red. And these are, of course, regular horizonless solutions that do not have uh, a, a black hole. In the center, they do not have an event horizon. So, uh, what is the image of a hairy black hole? So, to answer this question, let me first introduce a very academic setup again, just to, 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 to start. Um, so, you can take uh, these following setups you can take null geodesics that are emitted from a faraway source N here, which is a colored sphere. Um, and then N encloses both the black hole, which you can place in the center of the colored sphere and the observer. And so light rays that reach the observer uh, from the colored sphere are perceived in a local sky O, which kind of surrounds the, the observer. You can take this as a local S2 sphere. So in this context, an observation image defines a map between your local sky and um, the colored sphere N. So you can now define the shadow in a quite precise way. The shadow is simply the set of points in your local sky O that are not mapped to the colored sphere N, but rather to the black hole. And so light rays from this set asymptotically fall into the black hole when they are propagated backwards. And you can do this numerically. So as an example, some uh, ob examples of curve observation images are now displayed here. So with the shadow being represented in black, so uh, here is for flat space-time for comparison. 
uh, the image center is always pointing to the center of the coordinate system. And notice that the, the curve shadow is simply connected with a smooth edge. If you remove the, the colors, uh, just, just to focus on the, the, the edge. And again, uh, in most cases, the shadow is mostly circular, uh, unless you go to very high spins. And then it has that D-shaped uh, form that I mentioned before. So as a quick summary of how the shadows and lensing of these uh, hairy black hole solutions look like, uh, this blue line is Kerr. This is the shadow of an almost extremal black hole. And as you go to other configurations, you can see shadows that become highly, uh, have a deviation from the Kerr case, more squared in this case. And uh, in some cases, you can get quite wild shapes and very strong and chaotic like features in the image. So for example, for this configuration that we had named solution three, uh, you can see in some important uh, phenomenolog phenomenological aspects that the shadows can strongly deviate from the circular shape, in this case have an hammer-like profile, and they can become disconnected. As you can see here, they have a non-trivial topology. So that's quite a deviation from the curve case. And in addition, there are some chaotic lensing features that appear in the image which of course you might try to understand why this happens. And they, these features that are quite turbulent, uh, chaotic-like, they are even more apparent if you plot these, these images using a time delay function, which is a function which essentially def is defined as the variation of the time coordinate along each geodesic. And in this case, uh, you can check that uh, some regions, namely this chaotic part, require a lot more integration time by several orders of magnitude than others, which is fairly intriguing. And to understand this, it pays off to look at Hamiltonian, the, uh, the null geodesic flow um, described by this Hamiltonian H, which is zero for uh, null geodesics, where this P is just the four momentum of the photon. And since you have killing vectors for stationarity and axial symmetry, you have two constants of motion, E and L, which are respectively associated with the energy at infinity and the angular momentum at infinity. And the motion only depends on the ratio between these two quantities. And if you assume circularity, and actually for hairy black holes, this is one of the assumptions that is made, uh, you can separate actually these, these sum into two terms and one which is positive defined and another which only depends, uh, which depends of course on the position and also on these uh, uh, killing constants E and L, uh, which is always negative or equal to zero. So it kind of defines a potential V. And if you plot uh, the configuration space, in configuration space, the, a compactified radial coordinate and the theta coordinate, uh, you can represent the region where this potential is positive, which is, which is actually forbidden, and then represents the trajectory of the li a given light ray. So this region where the potential is positive works as a potential barrier, and it actually proves useful to interpret some features of the image. So in this case, this point one in the image corresponds to this blue trajectory that you can see here, if you select this point two on the shadow edge, you can see that there is a small opening and the light ray can just plunge into the horizon that lies at R, this capital R at uh, zero. And of course, if you select some other point, which is not on the equatorial plane line, the, the light ray kind of pounces a little bit between these two potential barriers. Okay, so if you now move to a boson star, which does not have an horizon, you can see something different you have this disconnected allowed region, and this can lead to bound orbits. And this, this region is actually connected with the existence of a stable light ray. And if you select this point too, you can see what happens. You have a light ray that enters this pocket, and uh, this opening is connected with, the, with an unstable light ring. So you have a stable light ring here, an unstable one a little bit further out. And if you select this point three, which in this more turbulent region in the image, you can see what's happening. You have a light ray that enters this pocket and can bounce back and forth a lot of times before being able to escape. 
And so that is why these type of plots are quite uh, useful to interpret why, why so certain features appear. Um, so the key point is that uh, because of this, this um, because of this, there are some geodesics uh, that can take a lot of integration time to lead. Okay, so until now it was uh, this, those, the, that description was fairly academic. You can then ask the question if it is possible to distinguish in practice a boson star from a curved black hole. Say. So now I'm going to report just on this slide some results from, from this paper, which I'm not, I'm not an author, but uh, the results are quite interesting nonetheless by Olivares and collaborators, uh, where they report, they analyze uh, the case of, of uh, an accretion flow around uh, a spherical boson star. And then, and, they, and then they compare with the Kerr case and Schwarzschild. Um, and although they have no shadow, uh, these, these boson stars, they can actually mimic a black hole shadow, as you can see quite nicely illustrated here. It kind of looks like a shadow if you compare with the other ones. But the key point, one of the key conclusions of the paper is that given comparable conditions, uh, the image size of this would-be shadow is actually smaller than Kerr. And so in principle, it would be detectable by the Event Horizon Telescope. For related and recent work about this, you can also see these two papers by uh, Vincent and collaborators. But let me rephrase this, uh, uh, continue discussion about this. Uh, if it's po still possible for a bosonic star, not necessarily a boson star, to mimic a black hole shadow, so as I discussed in the beginning, the black hole shadow is linked to the existence of light ring orbits. But an effective shadow can arise even if the object produces a stalled accretion flow torus. And this torus scale is connected with, with a maximum of the angular velocity omega of circular time-like geodesics outside the rotation axis. So this scale has been observed by the, these authors, Olivares and, and collaborators, to determine the torus inner edge in simulations, where the, this uh, magneto rotational instability, or MRI, is quenched in size. And it turns out that you can find um, a stable a spherical Broca vector field stars, which is a cousin model of the scalar case, that have a maximum of this angular velocity at a radius which is comparable to a Schwarzschild ice core, so innermost stable circular orbit with the same mass. So in principle, these Broca stars might be able to mimic the shadow of a Schwarzschild black hole. And although very realistic accretion flows have not yet been simulated for this specific configuration, we can still obtain the image of a Schwarzschild and Broca star with a very simplistic thin disk profile in, a very, in, ter in very naive terms. And these are the results. So on the left here, you can see this Broca star image where the disk stops at this uh, uh, radius scale where you have the maximum uh, of, the, or, of the angular velocity. And, and in, in this right plot, you have the Schwarzschild case where the disk stops at ice core. These are both for theta naught, so the observation angle, close to the poles at 17, angle, at 17 degrees. And this is not a coincidence. We have chosen these values so that it kind of mimics the observ observation conditions of M87 star. And he, although these two images uh, are distinguishable, mainly due, due to this feature, when you blur the images, there is a striking similarity. Although this, uh, you can, this is a feature that happens mainly when you, are, you, when you are close to the poles. If you observe these configurations close to the equatorial plane, you actually can see some differences. And this is due to the, also to the fact that these Broca star configurations uh, have a fairly uh, weak, uh, weak gravity well, uh, where for Schwarzschild that is not the case. Okay, so is it possible, let me now address a different question, if it's possible to grow a hairy black hole starting from a curved black hole. So as you probably know, the energy of spinning black holes can be classically mined uh, uh, through the phenomenon of subradiance, starting with a, with a residual bosonic field. 
So if you have a, a very small seed of such a bosonic field, it can grow into a microscopic condensate of bosonic particles, and it can store a large portion of the original black hole mass. And in fairly recent simulations, um, but, for, but now for a bosonic vector field, around 9% of the energy was extracted dynamically into the hair, and it formed a black hole with synchronized broca hair. So, so these, uh, you can see, check these references for work on this, on this, on this topic. But in any case, th there is a strong thermodynamic limit uh, for around 29%. So how much energy that you can act actually uh, extract from a curved black hole. And there is also the, the issue that these uh, black holes with synchronized hair, when they are formed, they are not absolutely stable. They are themselves prone to their own superadient instabilities. So there are two uh, important uh, timescales here. One is the formation of the scalar hair, starting with the curved black hole. So the maximum superadient efficiency uh, for a near extremal curved black hole happens for m mu around uh, 0.4. And for that uh, scale, you have a formation time of 10 to the fourth years. And if you leave these, these sweet spot, these, the hair growth time grows very fast and can easily reach 10% of double time. And then of, there is another time scale, with, which is the instability of the scalar hair after it is formed. And the, you, the key point is that these instabilities can be larger than the Hubble time if you uh, restrict yourself to MU smaller around 0.25. So the key point is that M87 star can grow effectively stable hair in astrophysical uh, timescales if you restrict the, these product uh, M mu between uh, these two values. This is the key point here. And since the, um, this candidate M87 star has a mass of around 10 to the nine solar masses, uh, this scale is essentially sensitive to a boson mass scale of 10 to the power of minus 20 electron volts, which is of course ultralight and outside the scope of the standard model. But they can find some motivations uh, in, in the QCD axiom and also in the low energy limit of string, string theory. You can see these references for more detail. So going back to the um, solution space of these hair block hole solutions, to this region of interest that I'm now focusing here is the solution diagram of black holes with scalar hair. And the region which is thermodynamically allowed, so to grow a hair starting from a curved black hole is this dashed region. And you can ask the question, how, this, how the shadow size changes for these hairy black hole solutions? If you select, for example, these um, green uh, solutions, so all these shadow size change for these hair black holes. So you can introduce this parameter P, which is simply the fraction of mass outside the black hole. And when you have P equals zero, we have simply curve. We have no mass outside the horizon. And when P equals one, all the mass is stored on the scalar field. And so you have no horizon. And so the shadow vanishes, it's the solitonic limit. And if you, you can compute that scaling factor, if you remember that I talked in the beginning of the seminar, how, how it changes with this factor uh, P, with this fraction of the mass P. Uh, so as you move from zero to one, this factor S goes from five, which is approximately the case for Kerr, and goes to zero. And although this is not a straight line, is very close to a straight line. So you can take this as a, 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 as a way to uh, estimate how, how, much, how much hair M87 star could support and still be consistent with the observations. You can take this uh, very um, conservative estimate of the uncertainty of around 10%. And so uh, black hole shadows that are 10% smaller than Kerr in principle should be still be compatible with the event horizon telescope observations. So if you take this curve deviation percentage-wise of around 10%, uh, 
you can estimate that uh, you can take a value of p of of uh, eleven percent. So uh, you can have a black hole of m eighty seven star um, with about eleven percent of the total mass in the scalar field, and in principle will still be consistent with the observations uh, within the current uncertainty. This is a, 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 a fairly naive approach. A more careful approach um, that you can make is take the actual uncertainties of, on the ratio m over l. Uh, for example, for the star motions, you can check these data uh, for m87 star. You can check this paper that has this, this, uh, this actual data. And then you can ask the question, um, given these uncertainties, how much you can this value p and s change such that the observation angle of the shadow falls within the observed um, uh, observed range with the, with the given uncertainty. And so if you plot this m over l as a function of p uh, within one sigma of this uncertainty, you conclude that you have, can have a hairy black hole with about 12% of the mass in the scalar field, which is of course consistent with the more naive approach that we took earlier. And if you go to two sigma, uh, on these uncertainties, uh, you could have an, a hairy black hole consistent with 24% of the mass in the scalar field. And just for completeness, let me just mention these, the gas motion measurement for M87 star, which uh, disfavors hairy black holes. But let me also mention that there's some tension with the Kerr model uh, from DHD data. This is actually mentioned in their paper. OK. Uh, so that was the first part. How, how much time do I still have? Yeah, let's say around five minutes. Okay. Uh, so uh, let me just briefly discuss um, this. If I, I, I hope I, <laughs> I can still finish this part at least. Uh, but I would like to, to discuss some results of this recent letter that uh, I wrote in collaboration with Carlos Herdeiro uh, as an editor's suggestion in PRL, which hopefully has an argument which you might find uh, elegant, hopefully. Uh, so with the observations of gravitational waves by LIGO and the black hole shadow by the Event Horizon Telescope, we have a window into the strong gravity regime close to black holes. And the observation signatures of both the gravitational wave ring down and the black hole shadow are strongly connected with a special class of null orbits called light ring, which, if you remember, are simply spatially closed circular null geodesics. And circle symmetry, the clustering of these light ring orbits, forms the more familiar concept of a photon sphere. And although light rings are known to exist in multiple space times, such as Schwarzschild and Kerr, the analysis of these specific black hole solutions in the literature has built an expectation in the community that all black holes must be surrounded by a light ring orbit. But this expectation is not generally based on a solid foundation. So this leads to a very natural question. Does an equilibrium black hole always possess a light ring orbit? And although it is plausible, it is also not trivial to give a generic answer. For example, how can we be certain that a light ring will exist around a black hole if we take, say, has a, a black hole that has no clearly defined equatorial plane? Nevertheless, it is important to state that there are few results that do exist in specific setups, assuming, for example, spherical symmetry. And in contrast, the result I'm going to discuss aims to be a little bit more general. So in this part, I'm going to assume a very generic equilibrium black hole space-time in four dimensions. The space-time is assumed to be stationary and actually symmetric, which is fairly reasonable and in an equilibrium state. The horizon is also assumed to be a non-extremal healing horizon with spherical topology, and we critically assume that the space-time is asymptotically flat. In addition, we require continuous second-order derivatives at at least, and finally, we assume that the space-time satisfies causality, which is fairly standard, and also circularity. And due to the killing symmetries, we can restrict the analysis to a spatial two-dimensional space, which can be parameterized by an orthogonal spherical-like coordinates r theta. Then we can make some gauge choices. 
you can take the coordinates r theta to reduce to spherical coordinates at asymptotic infinity. And we can fix the horizon at a constant radial coordinate. So having discussed these underlying space-time assumptions, we can now make a few comments about the geodesic motion. Due to the Killing symmetries, the Hamiltonian can naturally be used to construct a potential H, which, uh, which importantly has a vanishing gradient, he, uh, is both the necessary and sufficient condition to determine the location of a light ring. And to simplify the discussion, uh, I'm going to ignore the fact that there are usually two potentials for H, each for a different rotation direction, and I'm going to consider only the positive one. Okay, but let me just make a brief detour in our discussion. Let's assume for the moment that the scalar potential H now defines the height of different points on a hill, where these equipotential lines near the top of the hill have a profile similar to the one on the left image. And imagine now that you take a walk around the hill along the closed red path in the image. And the gradient of your function h will always be pointing inwards. And it is simple to conclude that a maximum exists inside. So let's try to find a rule that expresses this intuition in a more concrete way. You can see how the vector direction has changed with respect to the initial position a by looking at the angle indicator, which is the small circle next to the drawing. And in positive direction as this play starting point the direction of the gradient is again the same but the integrated angle does not vanish and so if you look at the angle indicator the vector has made one full turn in the positive direction and this number does not depend on the exact path around the hill as long as the hilltop is contained within the path so you can write our first rule that a maximum or a minimum, for that matter, leads to a positive full rotation of the gradient vector. And next, we can take a more challenging setup, which are two small hills connected by a saddle point. Now, when we walk in the positive direction um, of a path around the saddle point, the gradient vector is rotated in the negative direction. And this is displayed in the angle indicator as a negative blue angle. And after you move along the contour and you return to the initial position, the vector has made a complete rotation in the negative sense. And so this is our second rule, which applies when the path contains a saddle point inside. So what happens when you have a path that includes both a maximum and a saddle point? So in this scenario, uh, as we start moving, the angle indicator starts showing a negative blue angle. But at some point, the angle indicator inverts its direction. And in the end, after returning to the initial point, the integrated angle has vanished. And so the conclusion is that the number of turns follows an additive property, with final number of rotations being simply the sum of the contributions of the stationary points inside the path. Okay, so let's apply this to our original problem. We can take a two-dimensional plane that can be parameterized, say, by cylindrical light coordinates rho z with a black hole on the coordinate center. We can then start defining our path. We can just first choose a section with a constant radial coordinate close to the horizon, and then continue this path by joining two sections with a constant theta close to the rotation z-axis. And then you can close the contour with a section that has a constant radial coordinate at a large radius. And then we can modify the path like so uh, and make it approach both the horizon, the axis and spatial infinity. And it is under this limit that virtually any point outside the horizon can be contained inside the path. Then you can set some physical conditions. The condition for a finite which is scalar close to the horizon makes the gradient have a positive radial component. Uh, in a similar way, a finite which is scalar close to the rotation axis fixes the gradient orientation in the direction of the axis. And finally, at asymptotic infinity, the gradient must have a negative radial component. And so let's find out how the vector field rotates when we circulate the path in the positive sense. And for this, you might take this angle indicator 
uh, to be quite helpful for this. So you can see right away that the vector starts rotating in negative sense. And the, although the integrated angle does not uh, have a monotonic behavior necessarily, it can invert directions at some points, like so. But when all is said and done, after you return to the initial point, the gradient factor has described a complete negative rotation. And so this means that there exists at least one subtle point uh, of the potential inside the path. And so by construction, this means that there exists at least one light, light ring orbit outside the horizon. So this is essentially the basic idea behind the argument uh, and the conclusion of this part. So notice that we made virtually no assumptions for the matter content or the underlying gravity model. And this approach also shows our asymptotic flatness is a key boundary condition. So uh, you can, of course, ask natural question. With other asymptotic behavior, would you have black holes without light rings? Which is a fairly intriguing question. There's actually some recent work uh, about this point in uh, asymptotic Melvin, where it turns out it, it might not be uh, necessary for, for a black hole to have a light ring orbit. Okay, so let me wrap up. Uh, that recent image of M87 star opened a window in the strong gravity region. Uh, and then there are still a lot of uh, questions uh, and answers that have not been, um, we still don't have a, quite an answer what's the true description of the, of the, uh, of the M87 black hole uh, candidates. Um, and namely the observations um, are still consistent in principle with the existence of a scalar field profile around the black hole. And I will stop here. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Pedro, for the nice talk. Now we have some time for questions. Uh, in case anyone wants to ask, just please unmute yourself and feel free. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, yes. hi, yes. Uh, my name is Sebastian. Thanks for the very nice talk. Um, I have a question regarding the shadow of boson stars, which is um, in contrast to black holes, the matter that falls I mean, from the accretion disk cannot just disappear, right? So in principle, it should collide with the boson star and also emit some sort of light. I wonder if in these uh, figures that you showed, the accretion onto the boson star itself was taken into account in some way, because I would imagine it will uh, also change the way how the image looked like if you have radiation that falls on an object. So, so the type of interaction that you are mentioning, so these boson stars, they do not have a, a hard surface. So in these type of models, you have um, a, a scale, a bosonic field, a fundamental bosonic field uh, that does not interact with other, with other matter or even light rays uh, unless uh, gravitationally. So when you say an interaction, with which sort of interaction are you thinking about? I mean, the because matter is no hard surface. Yeah, no, not the hard surface, but the matter will fall somewhere where the boson star is, mm. right? Collide with the other matter, which is there. So it will heat up as well. And so I don't know, it's a complicated process. Yes. So the, the best, so in these models, you, um, you just take the, the space time of the boson star and simulate on top of it a, a test uh, accretion disk flow. So the type of interaction is only gravitational. You don't. You are not taking in, into account any possible interaction between the accretion disk and the matter content of the boson star itself. You are taking these two. Are uh, that interaction is ne ne uh, not uh, meaningful. Uh, but let me just say that uh, not sure if, if this was your question exactly. Although you don't have a hard surface and you don't have an horizon, there can be uh, in a lot of these stars you don't have an ice core exactly. So in principle, the matter could go all the way until the center. This doesn't happen in some situations, namely in this case, where you can have a stalled accretion flow torus. So if you have a maximum of the angular velocity of circular time-like geodesics, you might not have an ice core, so an innermost stable circular orbit. But in, when, you when you make the simulation, what was observed by in this paper here is that it can, you can have a, a, an inner torus where matter cannot fall more inside that radius. 
And this is due to the fact that you have these uh, magneto rotational instability quenched inside, and you and the matter cannot lose any further angular momentum. Uh, so this is not, not sure if this answers completely your question, but first you are not taking into account any possible uh, interaction between the scalar field and uh, and the matter of the accretion uh, and of the accretion flow, and you can have some situations where the matter has some way to not just plunge inward. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, I can see that there is a raised hand by Enrico. So, well, just uh, regarding this question, but, but if you if your mat even if your matter stalls. I mean, these are supermassive black holes, so there's a lot of accretion happening because we see them shining as quasars. So at some point, this, the approximation that you're making that the matter doesn't back react on the geometry will fail and you will form a black hole, right? I mean, it, it's not that you can go on giga years accumulating matter in, this, uh, uh, in, in these traps. Mm. No, it's a, it's, an, yeah, it's an... supermassive black holes are believed to grow by accretion. So they accumulate. Actually, they tend to the nine solar mass black hole. Most of that mass comes from we believe comes from accretion. So I mean, mm. so, so there is a, a, a uh, sorry. There was some there was some cuts in the communication. Uh, can you repeat this last part? Sorry. Yeah, I'm just saying that for for these black holes, accretion is very important. And I mean, it's follow up to to Sebastian's comment or question. And so, so he was asking if I could interpret his question, what happens when you keep accreting and matter accumulates and eventually you will form a black hole because you accumulate matter in the center of the boson star. Uh, so then, then you say, okay, but I have this, uh, uh, this, um, these pockets where matter could, uh, these traps where you say matter uh, could, could uh, accretion could stall because the magneto rotational instability becomes ineffective, but still matter will keep falling in on very long on cosmological scales. So at some point, back reaction of that matter on the geometry will become important, right? Mm -hmm. hmm. Yes, uh, I, so even neglecting the interaction between the, the scalar fields and the matter, if you continue, uh, if you have continuous accretion, at some point, you have to take into account the back reaction of the of the disk on the geometry. If I inter in interpret your question, yeah, uh, saying, you must. It's not the case if your matter falls in, inside the black hole, but yeah, for a boson star, yes, you will. Yes. Either the matter accumulates in the center, and therefore you will form. A, it's not a matter of back reaction. You will accumulate so much mass that you will form a black hole in the center, or somehow matter is ejected. Hmm. For some reason, and it, it could be. I know that I think there are simulations by Red Solar where there are signs of perhaps of that. But if the matter remains there, whether it's in the center or in one of these stalled accretion flows, you accumulate 10 to the 9 on, on in the age of the universe, you accumulate a billion solar masses. So it will definitely collapse to, to hmm. apply. Well, I guess that effect. Uh... It's it's an important. I, I thank you for for your comments. So it's indeed that effect has to be taken into account. Although I would say I think the authors in this paper actually comment about this. Um, there is the issue of the time scale. How much time you need for these effects of the back reaction of the of the accretion flow to become important on the on the geometry. Yeah, you do, you and do. Uh, right. and in in, in the, so. Regarding the matter uh, accumulating in the center due to this stalled this stalled accretion uh, torus, you that might not be the case necessarily, and you might have some mechanisms to eject some matter. So I wouldn't say that uh, that yeah, question yeah, has a very simple answer. Saying, but but you're saying the opposite. You were saying in your answer to Sebastian that the matter accumulates. I don't think that can be the case, because in fact, you, if you count the time scales. If you look at the accretion rate of AGNs today, you multiply by the age of the universe, you get that these systems accumulate a billion solar masses. Will have accumulated in the past. So it, the, either that mass somehow got transformed into the, the to, to boson, or it needs to have left, and mm -hmm. so it can't have just accumulated in these tall accretion flows. I mean, maybe it can. It can do that temporarily on short time scales, but on long time scales, I don't think it, it can. Mm. 
because it will eventually collapse. So I will, I will tend to agree that. with you. Yes, there would have to be some mechanisms to dissipate this, or otherwise it would collapse into a black hole. Turn into a scatter field because these boson stars, the, the, the energy comes from the, I mean, the energy is in the boson field. And uh, so if you want to explain why you have a 10 to the 9 solar mass boson star, uh, accretion could be a way to, to explain that, but then you need to convert bionic matter into the boson field, and uh, this can happen if there is no interaction between the two. Anyway, um, um, maybe we can take it offline and maybe this can, but, but yeah, I mean, just a comment. It's not a, it's a comment on prompted by, by your reply to Sebastian. So I was curious to hear your, maybe I can ask a quick question if there are sure. no. Uh, uh, um, yeah, th there is actually a question in the chat, so maybe if you want to answer that first. So, uh, uh, I cannot see the chat at the moment. Can you, can you say your question, then maybe I will ask mine. I can read it, don't worry, the one in the chat. It says if, uh, if you could repeat what is an example of a black hole without the light ring. Ah, the black hole without a light ring. So uh, in a light ring, just this is an important point. Uh, it's, so it's a perfectly circular. Um, uh, a closed orbit, planar orbit, and so it is kind of connected with the existence of, of a killing uh, vector field. So in the case of asymptotic Melvin, so there is this solution of Schwarzschild, which is asymptotically Melvin, not asymptotically flat, uh, you can get some, for some uh, values of the parameters, you can get a black hole that has no light ring. You still have a generalization of, of, the, of the photon region, but you don't have any light ring. It's a surprising result. And this is, can be nicely expected using uh, the type of arguments that I uh, uh, described in the end using this contour, this contour uh, type of integration. You can expect that the, a light ring should not exist or might not exist. Uh, because the total uh, charge, topological charge inside the contour is, is zero in some, in some cases. And so it might be possible to have no light ring. And indeed, for some parameters, you don't have one. Um, you still have some orbits, uh, but they are not circular. Yeah, so, so Enrico, go ahead with the last question. Uh, I mean, in my, it was just a very generic question because in the beginning you mentioned the, the distinction between uh, uh, Simplified astrophysical models, and then you mentioned thin accretion disk, uh, GRMHD simulation. What's your uh, opinion on how well do we have uh, under control uh, systematic effects in the description of matter? Because there has been a lot of uh, controversy in the literature whether the that shadow that we see is really due to 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 GR to the light ring to to photon propagation in, in curve or whether it's due simply to, to, to a sharp edge or, or to something else happening in the, in the accretion disk profile. Mm. So um, what I would have to say about this uh, is I, I, my, well, it's my, at least uh, from what I have read as well, uh, although I don't work, uh, I don't work um, myself with the dynamic accretion flows, but um, from my understanding is that um, the image that you observe uh, in the, by the uh, synthetic images with the dynamic um, accretion flow, you have to be a little bit careful trying to make a connection with the shadow edge. Uh, so I, I think I, at least I try to, to convey this, this point um, by saying that uh, um, that actually the shadow, uh, this diameter that you see in the image, doesn't exactly have to coincide with black hole shadow edge. And this is even acknowledged in the paper by the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, although I, I, I think it's fairly convincing that there is a strong connection between both things. Um, and uh, regarding the systematics of the accretion flow, I'm afraid I don't know, um, I'm not an expert on the details of the accretion flow model, but um, my understanding is that is the best that to, in the literature that we currently have. So, um, but I cannot comment much further than that, and I'm afraid. 
Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so if there is no last minute question, uh, let me thank you again, Pedro, for your seminar. Thank you very much for, for being here.